More, good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to give everybody a few minutes to get settled and log on, and then we'll get started. For everyone who's just arriving, we're going to get started in just a moment. I'll just give you time to get settled and, and log on to Zoom. Okay, so we may get more arrivals as we go on, but I'll just uh, begin with a little bit of an introduction. Thank you for everybody who's here for joining us today. My name is Rennie and I'm a counselor at AGI. And if you're joining us for the first time at AGI or Alzheimer Group, we support people who are living with dementia and those who support them through programming for people living with dementia, counseling and support groups for caregivers and education. So today's lecture is being made possible by the generous support of the Lindsay Memorial Foundation. I just want to make a couple housekeeping notes before we begin. Please keep yourself on mute throughout today's lecture. If you have any questions for the presenters or you have any comments that you'd like to share, pre please write them in the Q&A box, the chat box, which you can find along the bottom of your screen, and we will be sure to address them. I'll make sure it gets read aloud. Um, at, the, at the end of a lecture or whenever it's appropriate. So today's lecture, A Guide to Palliative Care in Quebec is part one of two. Part two is going to be held on April 22nd, so stay tuned for that. And just a note as well, you will be able to get a copy of the slide deck that our presenters are using today. Um, so you can refer to that after today's lecture. So without further ado, I would love to introduce our speakers that we are lucky to have here today. We are joined here today by Zelda Freitas. Zelda is a social worker and the coordinator of the area of expertise in caregiving at the Center for Research and Expertise in Social Gerontology, CRIGES. And she has extensive experience in the provision of psychosocial care to adults in loss of autonomy. Zelda is a member of the Council on Palliative Care since 1998, offering educational presentations on topics related to caregiving issues, grief and loss, and access to care. She has been recently named as an adjunct professor at the McGill University School of Social Work. And we are also lucky to be joined today by Patrick Durivage. Since 1999, Patrick has been interested in the elderly population receiving palliative care. For many years, he was an accredited regional trainer and runs trainings for professionals on clinical tools related to loss of autonomy. He has contributed to the creation of various trainings and manuals on palliative care. He is part of the McGill Council on Palliative Care, a not-for-profit not organization that educates the general public about palliative care. In 2015, Patrick was appointed at the Quebec End of Life Commission. I'll now hand it over to you, Zelda and Patrick. Again, um, if you're attending today, you can feel free to put questions in the chat throughout the lecture and I'll make sure to address them when we can. Uh, so Zelda and Patrick, we are really all looking forward to learning from you today. Thank you. Thank you, Rennie. And thanks for the Alzheimer's Society to invite us to present today on a topic on palliative care, but specifically to the end of life uh, law that's been in place uh, since 2015. So. Welcome all, and uh, this presentation will be uh, co-chair co and co-animated by me and Zelda. So um, here we are today. Just a quick correction there, Patrick. I know it was a little bit of a slip of the tongue, but it's uh, the Alzheimer's group uh, and not the Alzheimer's Society. Just, just to, to make a sure slip. We're, we're talking to the right, to the, <laughs> to the audience we plan to today. <laughs> So um, I'm just gonna uh, jump in then. Uh, we're gonna jump back and forth a bit. So hopefully we'll do that in a very coordinated way as we usually do. Uh, today, we're, uh, we're speaking to you from the Center for Research and Expertise in Social Gerontology. We wanted to touch base just a little bit about who we are and what we do. So uh, we're the coordinators of the areas of expertise. As you see on the, on the screen, there are four areas of expertise. I'm the coordinator for the caregiver caregiving uh, expertise. So what we do is we work 
with, with researchers uh, and we validate and develop and test leading edge practices that will help enhance practice um, and also do quite a bit of teaching and knowledge transfer activities. Uh, we have another uh, area of expertise that's called inclusion, aging, diversity, health and well-being, uh, which is very large, but it really incorporates a lot of the uh, activities around uh, the inclusion of older adults in, uh, in, in community and in, in, in everyday life and what are some of the challenges that they, that they face uh, to make that happen. I'll hand it over to Patrick. Yes, and Zelda is the uh, coordinator of the uh, leading practices uh, in caregiver issues. So I'm the coordinator of the community um, palliative care for seniors, uh, specialized with seniors. And we have another also uh, area of expertise, which is uh, countering mistreatment of elder uh, adults. So we have a provincial line on elder abuse prevention. Uh, this um, area of expertise has been in place for the last 25 years, so it's well known and it's uh, we're, we're happy to have them uh, on board with us. So just in terms of the presentation, um, just to touch base on that, we will be uh, presenting today the first part. Uh, there are four components to the law. So today we'll be talking about advanced medical directives and access to palliative care. And of course, we'll leave some time for some questions and because uh, we'd really love to hear from you and hear your questions. Uh, the second part will be next month and then we'll be talking about continuous palliative sedation and specifically about medical aid, aid in dying. And again, having a brief period of time for, for questions as well. So like already said, if you have questions, if there's anything that's not clear and you want to, you know, want to uh, communicate with us throughout the presentation, please put that in the chat uh, or, you know, speak to Renny directly. And we'll be very happy to, uh, to clarify anything that may not be clear in the, in the presentation um, as we move forward. So today we're going to use a uh, case study presentation to kind of illustrate the uh, progression of a di disease and we'll, of course we took uh, Alzheimer's uh, disease today to kind of illustrate the, the different steps and phase of the disease and linked with uh, access to palliative care today. So today we'll start with uh, access to palliative care uh, with a little description of the law and then we'll move to the uh, advanced medical directive. So the law on uh, end-of-life care was passed in 2015, put in, in place in 2015 which uh, encompass like two major components that we mentioned at the beginning. So there's the rights of the patient at end of life and the organization and the framework on how that uh, end of life care is provided through the, the CSNCS, which is the health organization we have in Quebec, which encompasses, well, of course, palliative care and continuous palliative care sedation. Uh, palliative care sedation will be presented next week. So today we'll focus on palliative care and advanced medical directives and and then part two, we'll discuss um, uh, medical aid in dying. Uh, so as you heard in the news, there's been some modifications with, uh, on the federal level. So we're happy that in the next presentation will be in a few weeks. So we'll have some, enough time to gather all the information and guidelines that are coming up in Quebec to see how it's gonna apply in Quebec. So we're kind of relieved that uh, the, pre the presentation will be in the next few weeks. So we'll be able to update the info that we have right now on that topic. In terms of uh, what's important to remember about the law, the, the core value of the law is really self-determination. So if this is a key component of the law, that's kind of the value that's behind the law, which uh, really looks at the patient's choice of uh, getting the right care they want. Especially with uh, dementia, it could be a bit tricky though, however. So if it's possible to have that conversation before the patient's much advanced and the, with the dementia will help the caregiver to navigate uh, the, the care and to get the service at the right moment. So that's tricky. And we'll keep that in mind in our case presentation to help you to when is the right moment to request palliative care? When is it the right moment to ask their family, your family doctor to see if it's appropriate to request palliative care at that moment? So we'll keep that in mind with a case study. And, uh, but we also are very cognizant of your, your, reality, your reality as a caregiver uh, in navigating the healthcare system and to request service at the right moment. So that'll be true throughout the course of the two presentation. So like I mentioned, the law two is based on the right of the individual and really looking at the importance of the organization and the management of the, uh, the care that's provided at the end of life and looking at the wish of the individual while considering also uh, the caregiver's perspective. 
So the advanced directive allows a person to uh, request uh, or to deny uh, care they would like to have in the future, but we'll talk a bit, bit longer. Zelda, you have something else to add? No, okay. No, I think no. Um, if we move to the next slide, I think it'll be a little bit clearer in terms of, uh, as with any law, there is always a governance and a structure that uh, that comes with law. And so I think it's really important, we think it's really important that people understand the structure of this law so that you're well informed about what, what it, how it could impact your particular situation. So. You know, the, the law law covers uh, a number of very important aspects that touch our lives and our individual choices, as Patrick emphasized. The governance of this law is the Minister of Health and Social Services. So it is uh, the responsibility of the Minister of Health and Social Services to, to put in the structures that will support uh, the different aspects of this law. So every health and social service agency, uh, so every CS and CIS, um, must uh, have some governing uh, structure in place so that people could access end of life care that is provided by the different institutions and the hospices and residences that are part of that CS and CIS. Um, and each institution within the CIS and the CIS um, has to also have an organizational plan and a clinical program that, that speaks directly to end of life care. Um, and so whether you're operating a CLSC, for instance, or whether you're operating a palliative care a unit or a palliative care residence um, or a, a hospital, an acute care hospital, they all have to have in place some an organizational pl plan that speaks directly to end of life care. So that's important. Uh, we really feel it's important that people understand that this is something that is there for you and for and for you to be informed of. Next slide. So providers of end of life care. Again, we are talking about the four different components of the law. Um, so any health network is must provide end of life care. These are the provisions that are in the law. Um, palliative care residences can determine end of life care services that they offer on their premises. So this basically speaks to the fact that there are some palliative care residences that you might have heard of over the course of time since 2015 that have decided to opt out, for instance, of providing medical aid and dying. Um, and so this is left to the individual center uh, to determine what they can and what they are willing and able to offer within their own premises. Um, it's also noted in the, in the law that private practice doctors and nurses can provide end of life care at home. Um, so again, I think that was something that needed to be clarified. We do know that there is a private uh, healthcare system parallel to the public. Uh, and that there are private practice doctors that do home visits. So uh, this is another uh, provider of end of life care that uh, that's that's mentioned in the law as well. Mm -hmm. So in the law too, uh, what's different from all the other um, policies that Quebec came uh, uh, around in the last 30 years, it really recognized that people can have access to health care. It's now set and described in the law as a right. So a user that needs palliative care have the right to request palliative care or their caregiver. So it's really a, a game changer and uh, hasn't been discussed very much in the news or in the coverage in terms of this important aspect of the law. So law two, there's been a lot of uh, emphasis put on medical and dying, of course, because it's a new, it's a new care that was, that's provided in Quebec, but not a lot of uh, discussion in terms of that Law 2 uh, recognizes that people have access to palliative care and it's in their right to request palliative care when it's clinically appropriate, of course. So um, it's really important to see that, uh, that element and look at, okay, um, there's documentation that exists. There's someone online, like Zelda was referring to them, uh, the CIS and CIUS. They have to put their program on, on the internet and put some basic information. There's also 811 that could help you to navigate the healthcare system to get, okay, who's providing palliative care in my network. But also there's a, this document that, uh, that's available online. It's called Rights of a Person and End of Life. It's, it explains what is palliative care, what is different care, what it's built to. And it's written like, uh, in a way that's very accessible. So a very lame person type of the, 
a description of what palliative care is versus creative approach uh, versus uh, medical and dying. So I know in Quebec the last few years, there's been big focus on, on uh, medical aid and dying and end of life care, but there's the palliative care approach that exists that people have to be aware of and when it comes to into play. Uh, just as uh, first um, warning, of course, with dementia, it's a bit difficult to estimate when uh, palliative care uh, begins. It's part of the disease trajectory that somebody will lose their faculty, not just cognitive faculty, but there'll, there'll be some loss of autonomy. At one point, they'll stop walking, they'll stop be able to feed themselves, they'll need more physical assistance. And even somebody with, who's kind of bed bound or not moving at all, they could live six months, a year or two uh, in that condition before uh, path care will begin. So it's tricky for caregivers to ascertain when is the right time to request palliative care. But that's something that you should discuss with your care team, your family doctor, your home care team, uh, or your different specialists that, you're, that, you're, that your loved one is linked to, to see when palliative care uh, should start. However, in Canada, in, in a part of the uh, North America, it's now considered that palliative care is, uh, should be offered earlier on to patients with, uh, with dementia. Uh, dementia is uh, a situation that's a condition that uh, you're not able to cure. So therefore, we should start talking about dementia care with dreaded care, but also maybe a palliative care approach. Not able to cure dementia, but we should compensate the different signs and symptoms and the different behaviors and use a bit more uh, an approach that's uh, suitable for those individuals and families. So the get-go, the learning uh, that we should want you to uh, remember or the key element of the, the law too is that palliative care is a right, but for many, many patients out there, and especially patients with uh, Alzheimer's disease, that it's difficult to access palliative care. And we'll give you some tricks on how to do it in the different care settings that we'll present later on. So you're entitled to request palliative care, and not just for seniors. So if you're uh, uh, an individual that's 14 years and older, you're able to request palliative care if your medical situation is uh, is uh, required to request that type of care. A person can also request palliative care even though they refuse it in the past. So even though that you, re you refuse to uh, be followed by palliative care, you can still request it in the future uh, and when you're ready for it to receive palliative care. Of course, it's a voluntary service uh, that's very useful at end of life and we we'll could define what end of life means. Uh, it can, it's not longer just three months uh, time frame. It could be over a, a time frame of a year or two. So palliative care, it can be provided throughout the end of life. And uh, of course, if you have difficulty to access palliative care, keep in mind that you're entitled to file a complaint with any uh, commission of complaints in, in every healthcare system or establishment in Quebec. And that complaint uh, has to be prioritized from the uh, commissioner complaint. So any complaint that uh, regards end of life issues or palliative care access, the commissioner complaint, they have uh, a, a limited time to respond. For general complaint, they have a certain time frame. I think it's 60 days and uh, that has to respond to you. But for any complaint regarding palliative care, they should respond much quicker, like within a few days they should really uh, respond to you and help you navigate to request palliative care. It's appropriate for your loved one. Zelda, you are gonna talk about the Tidley family. So, so these are, I mean, you know, we're talking about a, a, the law and the stipulations in the law and the provisions of the law. And this is a lot of, a lot of information to take in. And so what we wanted to do is try to walk through uh, and journey through uh, a typical possibly typical scenario that will perhaps bring to light some of the uh, provisions of the law in, in more practical ways. So the Tilly family is an, it's just a case example. It's a fictional case example. Um, you wanna just push on the, put on the first bullet. So it, uh, it's basically a story of a gentleman of 77 years old who is diagnosed with early on stage uh, Alzheimer's dementia, Alzheimer's disease. 
Um, we, you know, typically being diagnosed in a geriatric clinic, uh, he, they may be given some, you know, uh, medication to help with, uh, you know, um, slowing down uh, memory loss. Uh, and he continues on with his regular activities with maybe a little bit more of an eye from his family members to see how he's doing. And he continues, for instance, maybe participating in some uh, uh, volunteer activities, uh, again, with the family sort of uh, being extra, have an extra eye on what's going on and how he's how he's coping with with what's with this new diagnosis and how everyone is as well. Um, you know, we talk about, you know, progressiveness of this of this illness. So with, say, two years time, we could make that perhaps a marker in that his situation gets uh, worse in that perhaps there is a sentinel event where he may have get get lost on his way home from his volunteer work so that we notice uh, the family will notice that there is a change in his in his situation um, and um, his GP and uh, re, you know recommends for instance at this point in time still early on in the disease um, uh, uh, an ID, uh, some kind of a uh, wandering ID, a bracelet of some sort, so that could help with the with the uh, with the wandering or maybe the, the possibility of him getting lost. So, what we wanted to demonstrate is that there's this progression that's going on, that there's this, this disease that is that is uh, that is is taking over a little bit more and more space uh, and uh, and worry in in his family and uh, in in himself. Then we, we think about um, you know, the possibility at this point that there are uh, programs and perhaps activities that are starting to become involved in his life. And for those of you that are caregivers and family members, you, you have probably lived this kind of progression where it starts off slow, things happen, some events happen, more outside resources might be getting involved. So here we gave the example of Mr. Tilly being referred to the AGI day program by his GP. Um, there is a little bit more cognitive de decline. Um, he continues to participate in some of his uh, regular activities, uh, but with some modifications. So maybe now his wife or his son might be driving him to the Meals on Wheels program where he volunteers because he's still able to help out in the kitchen cutting up vegetables, but he's not able to maybe get there on his own or they're concerned about that, or maybe someone goes with him. Um, and so this is... Um, this is where now maybe he gets referred to the CLSC at some point in this trajectory um, and the home care team gets involved. And it may be at this point in time or ideally uh, at this point in time where we start talking about one component of the law, which is called advanced medical directives. So in this situation, Mr. Tedley is still able to consent to care. His uh, faculties are still... Um, Okay, so he's, he's able to understand what's presented in front of him. He's able to uh, uh, make that information. He's able to personalize information to himself. He's able to make some decision in terms of what he wants in terms of uh, future care. So, uh, of course, uh, for an advanced medical directive, it's part of law two, which is end of life. But advanced directives could be uh, discussed um, at any time of life. You know, if you're 18 and up, you could look at uh, advanced directives and uh, look at what type of care you would like to have in the future in a situation that you become inap. Inap is being incompetent or not be able to decide for yourself because you don't have the cognitive faculties to uh, uh, assess the situation and personalize it to, to your own situation and make a good uh, sound uh, decision on the care that you would require in the future. So again, there hasn't been a lot of attention in media on about advanced medical directive. Uh, the great part of it, uh, advanced medical directive, uh, it's kind of a, a vehicle so a person could express their wish in the form that's set by the government and that you could have uh, decide what type of care you want in the end of life context. So the advanced directive is really, it's a voice of the patient when they're not able to express themselves uh, in certain condition. And we'll look at the condition and we'll also look at the different care that you can consent or refuse. But again, um, if you haven't heard about it, uh, it's quite normal. There's been a few ca uh, publicity campaign 2015 and there hasn't been a lot of uh, media coverage about it to kind of uh, encourage people to to uh, look it up and to uh, to do it. 
So again, uh, there's a nice uh, a flyer that exists. You could uh, download it from the internet and uh, check. Uh, there's also a different website uh, that explains advanced uh, directives. So uh, this document is available in French and English. And in our PowerPoint, you'll have the different links to uh, upload the different uh, documents that we put in the PowerPoint. So advanced directive is really set in the law, but uh, it's also, uh, like I said, a vehicle that replaces everything else that's been uh, in place. So if you draw a, a will where you set some a directive for your family in terms of you don't want active care, you don't want any error measures at the end of life, uh, if, you, if you have set with your family, perhaps a, a living will, or if you set also maybe uh, the document that from Speak Up website, to kind of elicit what you want in terms of care, that's all good. But the advanced medical directive is kind of formalized and it will surpass any directives that you set in the past. So once it's filled, signed, and sent to the back to the NQ, uh, this document will be put in a computerized registry while all the physician and some uh, frontline workers will have access to really see what type of care you want and, uh, and what you agreed or you refused on. So it's really important to keep that in mind. It's also important that uh, keep in mind that those directives could be modified throughout the year. So if you have uh, an event, if you're hospitalized and you saw, okay, well, I received oxygen, I received an intubation, and maybe it was okay to consent to it. Uh, maybe you change your mind and you want to modify your advance directive. It's possible to revoke it and you just have to request a form and send back to the rent to uh, revoke the previous one. So the good part of it is it's now it's a computerized registry where all patients could uh, definitely uh, send it and uh, make it accessible. So what does it apply? You know, advanced directives, it's really for in a situation when the patient is not able to consent to care because of many situations. Uh, of course, uh, if you look at the bottom, you look at Alzheimer's disease. Yes, it could be uh, a, a situation that when it's advanced, uh, your patient is not able to consent for the care. So it's good at the beginning of the diagnostic of uh, Alzheimer's disease to discuss that element with uh, the patient, see what type of care they would like to have in the future. But if you uh, unfortunately diagnose and it's your person is too advanced, of course, you're not able to fill those advanced directives. However, it's so important to consult the, the, the document and have that open the conversation with your loved one and your family to see what type of care the person would have liked to have. So it's still important to, have, to do that exercise, maybe not have it signed or have it process, but at least to have that conversation with the family and perhaps having your family doctor or your, one of the specialists to kind of answer some of the questions you may have. So the advanced directive will only apply uh, or be used when you're confronted with the end of life situation. So as the disease progresses, uh, the, advanced, um, the advancement of disease will eventually bring the, the, your loved one into a situation where there'll be only a few months or a few, uh, a few weeks in front of them and uh, that's the moment when uh, those advanced directives will be uh, discussed. So if your loved one has also maybe uh, in a coma state or they, had a, they, they were involved in a, uh, a car accident and they lost all their faculty to consent or they become in a coma state and the coma is irreversible, then advanced directives will be, uh, will be discussed with, with the loved one. So those are the type of situation when the advanced directives would be discussed and discussed with the family and also applied. It's very important to keep in mind that for as long as the patient is apt to consent, the treating team has to consult with the, the, the patient in terms of the care they want. And the advanced medical directives only addresses five specific care. So for all the other care, of course, the physician has to consult with the caregiver or the patient is able to consent uh, to his care. So it's very important to keep in mind that it's only very specific moments when the advanced directives will be applied. And for some patients, uh, it won't be applied at all because um, those care won't be uh, pertinent for them. So let's look at the type of care which a patient could consent. So uh, the patient's able to consent uh, to a pulmonary, uh, cardiac pulmonary resuscitation. Well, we come and use in the uh, medical term CPR. So when you see a, a medical show, like if it's a new Amsterdam or any type of other show that you see, they do those massage, they do uh, they use uh, those electric uh, uh, shock to start up the, the heart again. Well, this is what we call the CPR. And CPR 
is uh, something that uh, could help you to rest the state and uh, provide, uh, uh, they could definitely restart your heart, but in what condition will you be? That's something you'll have to discuss with your family doctor. Is it worth it to ha go through a uh, resuscitation? And not just talking about the broken ribs that you'll, that you'll have with those massage, but in terms of the condition, in terms of the loss of autonomy. So that's really something that specifically you have to discuss with your family doctor or your treating team to see, well, is it something that's really beneficial for my loved one at the state that they are? So I cannot answer for, for you today in terms of what, what should we go with or not, but that's the discussion you can have with your family doctor and your, of course your loved one to see, is that something that's, uh, that's good and beneficial for the, for the person that uh, has a heart arrest. The other care is the ventilated assisted breathing. Of course, during the COVID, we definitely had a lot of discussion in terms of those ventilators or respirators that uh, were kind of lacking in the healthcare system. So is it beneficial to integrate? Uh, is it beneficial for the person to keep to be kept on, on oxygen or on those machines? Uh, that's also, again, a discussion you want to have. And of course, some of the uh, patients, they have to consider their own beliefs, values, and also sometimes religion can play into effect in terms of uh, accepting or refusing certain care. So you really have to consent according to your own belief and what you believe that's uh, appropriate uh, for your own health and what you may uh, consider uh, in the future. So it's good to have that discussion with your family so they will be aware in terms of what type of care you want. So fill in the form is important, but also have that discussion with your caregivers, hopefully you have more than one, that could speak up to you and inform the treating team, hey, my loved one signed it, advanced directive, please consult it. The other care uh, to consent is dialysis. Well, it's a treatment that uh, helps to purify the blood because their kidneys are not able to filter the, the blood and to uh, keep the, uh, the, the blood system going. So that's a uh, type of treatment that's offered. Uh, there's some patients that are on dialysis for many, many years and it's helpful, it's beneficial, but really, Keep in mind that dialysis is also to be offered at the end of life, and you have to decide if you want to go through it or not. And it could be very specific to your own health situation. The other two cares uh, are very difficult for a lot of caregivers to uh, consider, and it's forced hydration and forced fe feeding. Um, there's been a lot more studies that show you know, have, having that type of care at the end of life, in the end of context, like in the last few weeks or months, uh, it creates more arm for the person because their bodies are shutting down. So to force hydration and to force people to be fed either through peg feeding, like a, uh, not being fed uh, orally, but uh, through uh, different tubings, uh, it adds more pressure on the system and the body than what the body could digest and process. So actually having a forced hydration could be uh, very uh, difficult for the body and could create more adverse uh, reactions such as pneumonias, such as uh, water buildup, and uh, that uh, could not, well, won't be beneficial for the quality of life for the, that person. So those are the specific care that the uh, person can send. So it's five care and the three contexts that we mentioned earlier. So be at end of life and be either in a coma state or being uh, with advanced uh, cognitive decline, such as Alzheimer's, the body disease, or other uh, condition, condition uh, situation that could uh, prevent the person to be able to consent to care. So those are the very specific care. And of course, today I'm addressing for the, pers the person with the dementia, uh, with Alzheimer's disease, but it's also good for caregivers to also consider their own advanced directives. So a lot of caregivers are confronted to the healthcare system or have been witnessing the loss of a, a friend or family member, and they realize, oh, my friend went to um, CPR, and my God, I don't want that for myself. So it's also good for caregivers to even consider the advanced directives for themselves. So uh, why to consent to those cares? Well, it's to help you to uh, help you, but also help your families to be aware of the type of care you want. If you want all those cares possible, that's fine, but you'll have to keep in mind that all those level of care is pretty much an, an ICU uh, setting. So it's uh, the intensive care setting where you can be put on respirator, where you can be uh, monitored with your heart. So to have that type of uh, level of care, it's more a hospital setting. So it's very hard to have that type of care at home or in a private residence or even a nursing home. That type of care is really, it's more a medicalized, hospitalized type of setting. 
So when you consent to care, you also have to be cognizant of the care setting to which you are also consult you're also uh, consenting. So that's very important for caregivers and uh, and patients to consider, okay, uh, I may consent to all the care, but does it mean I'll finish my end of life in an ICU setting? So that's also to consider, something to consider and to discuss with your GP or your CLST or home care team to really look at okay, where that care is provided. And that may influence your decision also. Maybe you want to spend the last few days or weeks at home and you may forego those uh, those treatments because they're not adding quality of life at, at your end of life status. So it's a lot to take in, in terms of uh, advanced directive, because we haven't had, had that discussion in the general public. Uh, so you may feel that you're lost uh, with that discussion, but you should really look at, uh, it's yes, it's medical uh, directives, it's medicalized approach interventions, but it's also, uh, as a social worker, I see more, mostly as a relational aspect in terms of where you want to have the care and how you want to finish your, your life. Um, you want it more a hospitalized setting or do you want more a home care setting? I'll just give you a concrete, not, not concrete, but a very personal uh, story. My father-in-law wants all the care possible. He wants all the active care. He had two major heart incidents in his life. If there's another one that comes up, he wants to go to hospital. Uh, there's no question asked. Even at 88 years old, he still wants all the active care possible. So for him, he checked all consent care. And for the caregiver, my wife, it's uh, for her, it's no-brainer. If he has a heart arrest, 911, back to the hospital. And uh, the treating team will have to deal with uh, the, the situation and look at what uh, the type of level of care that he's going to have. So... Uh, be able to request uh, medical directives. Um, then you have the form that's been uh, done by the ministry that you could uh, request, and we'll show you how later on. But uh, there's been a lot of discussion in terms of uh, be able to request medical care and dying through that form. As we speak right now, it's not still possible. There is going to be a, a committee in the federal uh, government uh, to look at, okay, that possibly in the future, people may be able to request it. In. But as we speak right now, it's not in effect. It may take another year or two before it, that comes into effect. Uh, we don't know how fast or how slow it's gonna move. There's uh, the election coming down the, uh, the road. There's uh, many factors, there's still the COVID. Uh, so it's hard to predict uh, when that'll come into effect, but there's some, uh, there's some committee that will be formed to be looked at, and at uh, to be request medical and dying for uh, Alzheimer's patient, and we'll give you more information on that topic at uh, session number two. So how to request it uh, very uh, rapidly. Uh, the easiest way definitely, which I recommend my caregivers and patients I see is to call just the RAMQ. And you have this phone number here. You call the RAMQ, uh, you dial uh, advanced directives, and then you need to have your RAMQ card with you because they'll ask you for, for it. They'll ask to confirm your identity, and then they could mail it out to you and you receive it in the mail within a few days. It's pretty quick. And you need to consult your treating team, make sound decision. There are some information. There's some little pages on what the care is about, but there's also some information online which you consult uh, that could uh, guide you in terms of, okay, what type of care that, uh, that looks like. Then you have to have two witnesses to sign the form, not to convince you to change your decision on, but really to to make sure that you're the person that signed it and there's no pressure that you went through to sign it and that you're still able to consent to that uh, that uh, that care. And then you mail it back to the RAMQ. But before you mail it, make a few copies for yourself. Keep it in your own records. Keep a copy in your, at home. Keep a, give a copy to your family doctor. Inform your home care team or other healthcare team that you failed it. And keep a copy when you go also to, a, to a nursing home because nursing homes and uh, public nursing homes will ask you right at admission if you did sign your medical directives. So it's important to keep that. And inform your family and your caregivers that uh, that was done. And caregivers could be friends, could be neighbors, whoever that's involved in your physical and medical care or personal care, they should be informed that uh, it was done. Uh, activity. So I think Remy is going to uh, help us to break up uh, into uh, 
no, sorry, we decided that we're gonna have an open discussion about uh, this advanced directive. But if you have questions, because I think there's a few questions in the, in the chat box that maybe you could answer before we begin the activity by, by itself. So Remy, is there any uh, question that uh, the audience has before we uh, continue? Um, sure, Patrick. So a, a couple um, questions that I think people have on their minds um, that goes back to something that you just mentioned is, um, you know, if someone's in a situation where they maybe have never had any of these conversations about end of life planning about advanced care directives with um, their GP, for instance, is that mm. something that, you know, they should insist on or, you know, a conversation they should, you know, make sure they're bringing up what, how, do, how does someone navigate that kind of situation? Good question. Well, um, that type of conversation takes time. And we know that GPs are pressed with time. Uh, so when you take an appointment with either the secretary or whoever that you take the appointment, ask for a bit more time to discuss advanced directives. Uh, so the GP could uh, allocate a bit more time for the session so they could answer the questions. So it's very important uh, to, uh, to have that open discussion if there's any questions that you want. I would definitely uh, suggest the person to uh, ask their form from the RANQ, read the document. You could go also on online. There's a Quebec.ca uh, uh, website where the advanced directives, there's some documents, there's some explanation in terms of the didn't care. Uh, there's also Edgalois that uh, provides some information. And you could also download the flyer that we saw that we uh, shown on the, the PowerPoint that explains the advanced directive. So I could get that information first. And if you have specific uh, questions with, with your own medical health, well, I think it's good to uh, raise those issues with your family doctors. If you have one, hopefully you have one. And then uh, if not with one of the specialists, uh, if you're diagnosed with, them, uh, with dementia, uh, you're probably either seen by a geriatrician or by a family doctor to have that diagnosis. So definitely have that conversation with that person. Uh, to discuss the type of care that would be beneficial for you in the future. And of course, it's always hard to plan ahead. Uh, and this, you're not planning for a trip. Uh, you know, that's easier. That's more fun. But uh, discussing advanced directives takes time. Uh, you need time to reflect. Uh, you may also want to discuss with your friends uh, what they uh, looked at and what they, they, consent, they consented and uh, to have that open discussion. Uh, but definitely, if there's some medical questions, I would definitely... Uh, uh, ask your GP. And if there's no GP at all, if there's no healthcare professionals involved, well, caregivers could also call 811 and speak to a nurse in full santé to have the discussion in terms of, okay, what that care really means. Uh, is that really wise to have that care when my, my, life, when my loved one's 90, 92, 93 years old and has a hard week, a uh, weak heart? So it's not the ideal situation because the nurse doesn't know your, your loved one that well, but the nurse has the medical background to explain the different care and what it entails. So uh, it's, the, uh, it's the scenario C uh, of all that list, but definitely if a family doctor is involved, they have an overview of uh, the medical situation and they could discuss frankly in terms of what uh, the level of care, uh, not the level of care, but advanced directive is, uh, is beneficial or not for them. I think what's important to add as well is that we have to inform ourselves. So as much information as you can find out for yourself about what these different directives are. Um, and then, you know, with your questions, approach your GP uh, with some very concrete questions. So that way they could link, you know, the, your medical history with your questions and what information you already have. Uh, there's a lot of information online about these different uh, acts, these different medical acts. So it's really important that uh, you get good information uh, and then you can formulate your questions around, around the information that you do have and, uh, and approach your GP about that. I'm just a little concerned about time. So I'm wondering if, we, if there's any other questions in the chat about um, advanced medical directives, Renny? We do have a couple questions. Um, I can... Shoot let you know about them if you don't mind. Yeah. So we have one question, somebody's asking, um, can your grown children be your two witnesses? Uh, yes, yeah. yes. Thank as, you. Long as, as long as they're 18 and up, there's no, there's not an issue. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And yeah, go ahead. No, I was gonna, go ahead, Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> thank That's you. We, we have, uh, 
next question. <laughs> we have just one more question um, as of right now, and then I mm -hmm. do want to make sure you have enough time to finish your slides. Um, but we have someone in, in the crowd who's asking, um, we have a mandate as part of our will. At mm -hmm. this point in time, my husband cannot do what you're suggesting. Is the mandate sufficient to achieve his wishes? Well, in your mandate, uh, it's pretty. It's written a, a very generic way. It's not as specific in terms of those five care. Um, so, of course, it, it could guide you because in the mandate, it's really it's, it's set in a way that's more in terms of objectives of care. It's not specific to the dose five care that's uh, listed in the advanced directive. So, um, but you could still have that do that exercise with your loved one and your family. It's okay. Well, if that situation happens, what type of care we're are, are willing to accept or refuse and the implication of it. So especially if uh, there's many family members uh, involved in the care and some members are abroad and it's, uh, you know, it comes to a situation when you're, the person is hospitalized because of sentinel event or there's a heart incident. Uh, of course, if you go to the ER and their, their objective is really to stabilize you. So they'll start the, the procedures if you don't have defense directives. Uh, and there's another form where we look after the, after the, the whole activity that's uh, it's more set in terms of the level of care. And the level of care could be discussed with your family doctor, and you could write the different type of care you uh, refuse also. So there's another way to do that without the patient consult, uh, consult uh, being uh, part of the, the discussion. I think the key, the key though, you know, if we talk about advanced medical directives or someone mentioned in the chat, the living will or uh, advanced care planning, which is more general, which more talks about more about values and preferences mm -hmm. uh, overall, including uh, me uh, medical directives is to really try to have that kind of conversation as earlier on, early on in the, in the trajectory of the illness, of course. Um, Having said that, if those discussions did not take place in the particular situation that the person just named when that the person they're providing care for could no longer sign in advanced medical directives, they still might be able to participate in a discussion around different wishes and values. Um, and or as Patrick said, you gather around the people that are important to that person and sort of say, well, what would he or she want? Uh, what do you know? What are some of the values that they hold dear to them? Uh, and what, what are the implications uh, of having those directives done or not? And so that there is an honest and open conversation. And what, what's best is that families are not put in a situation where they're in a crisis and making these decisions, because we all know it's very difficult to make these kinds of decisions in a crisis type of situation. And that's what will happen. Um, and there'll be a lot of pressure on the family to make those decisions rather quickly. Uh, and so having these discussions beforehand uh, is really important. Uh, and that's, that's the, you know, the key message I think uh, for us today. So if you had that discussion or not, uh, it's, uh important to maybe review it as the disease progresses. So, uh, because you may change your mind, uh, the caregiver can change your mind, uh, and that's, that's quite okay. Um, also, one element uh, that we didn't mention, but uh, those advanced directives could be also done in front of a notary. Uh, it doesn't have to, you can still order it and do it on, on your own and it's free. If you do it in front of the notary, of course, there's a little fee that the notary will charge, but uh, it could also done in front of a notary when you do your mandate or you will or other uh, notarized document. Uh, but if you do it on your own, it's still valid. Uh, you don't have to have your family doctor to sign it off. It's uh, it's your signature and two witness, and then you send it that in. If you have done your advanced directive, and if you have a mandate and you have to have a will, and you have some differences in terms of uh, directives it's going to be the mandate, it will be the advanced directives that will supersede all the other documents. So if you have done a mandate, or if you even have a, the mandate omelgated, then the mandatory uh, uh, that's assigned in, the, in your situation will have to respect the advanced directives, and the, the treating teams will have to abide with the advanced directives because that's the voice of the patient, regardless of any other legal documents. So that's very important to keep, to keep in mind that advanced medical directives will supersede all your other uh, directives that you could have uh, written up over the years. So it's really uh, your spokesperson when you're not able to speak at end of life. Other questions or maybe, maybe you open up uh, for pros and cons? 
So, so as uh, I just saw what Megan wrote in the chat, and that, that's true. You do not need to update your mandate if you want to change your advanced medical directives. You could just do it yourself. And I think another piece, I'm not sure if I heard you say it, Patrick, but I'll reinforce that, is that you can change your advanced medical directives. It's not written in stone because that seems to be one of the concerns that I've heard from caregivers is that you know once it's done, you can't do anything about to change it. And that's not true. You can change it and update Updated, new information comes out, new, you know, new ideas, you, you know, you have new preferences, you can update it and change it. And it's the last one standing in terms of these directives that will be respected and supersede anything else that you may have written before with yeah. regards to these particular directives. Okay. And of course, there's like uh, millions of uh, medical treatments that the hospital setting could offer. So for the other care, of course, the, uh, if the patient's not able to consent, uh, they're going to look for either uh, a spouse. Uh, that's the first level in the civil code. Uh, if the person's not able to consent, they'll consult with the spouse, then the, the children, and then the, any significant other that uh, has an interest or the best interest of the, the, the patient at heart. So those are the level of uh, consent uh, power for what we call a proxy in the other province, but uh, it's really uh, in keep important to keep in mind that yes you may have advanced directives but uh physician are also uh, obliged to consult family members they can't just proceed with uh, treatments without consulting and getting consent from uh, the family members the patient not able to consent so it's uh it's tricky for physician also to look at all the different uh treatment possible but who's going to consent to those different care so it's uh, it's a challenge to in the covid and pandemic uh, context on top of it to be able to inform the caregiver and explain the medical situation uh, in the ICU context or uh, the ER context. Other questions? Because we have a little bit of a presentation before we sure. wrap it up. So um, yes, I just want to say thank you for, I think you've just uh, answered these questions very helpfully. We don't have any further questions at, at this time. So I think it would be Perfect. great if you can provide the rest of your information. Thank you. So if we go, you know, well, just really quickly go back to the Tilly family again, looking at the trajectory. Um, so Mr. Tilly is now involved with the home care team. Um, they provide information about different options of care. So we're talking about advanced medical directives. We're talking about home care. We're talking about palliative care. We're talking about different options that are uh, available for the T Mr. Tilly and his family. And at this point in time, he chooses and his family supports him in the choice to remain at home for as long as possible. So this is a preference that he is able to express. And th this will guide the practice uh, and the rest of the trajectory of the illness in terms of how the illness evolves, that value, his preference will be kept in mind as much as possible uh, because for him, that's where his quality of life is. And so this is where we see where um, palliative care, advanced medical directives are intertwined with care. Um, and so when people say, what is palliative care? Well, this is part of what palliative care is, is having these open and honest conversations about what are, where would you like to live the, you know, in, in the best days of your, your life in the future? Uh, where do you see yourself? Where does your family see you? What kind of care needs will you have, et cetera, et cetera. And so again, going along with this adapted care, uh, they adapt to services at home, uh, ideally receiving psychosocial, emotional, and practical support for the caregivers and the family that are caring for him and adjusting the care plan uh, according to uh, the, the, the deterioration that the illness will cause in, in this particular situation or in any other situation. So that's where um, we see the two, the parallels of the, of the illness and um, the, um, the advanced medical directives. Because at this point in time, uh, he's able to express his, some of the values that, he, that he, he, he feels is important to him, his preferences and that of the family. Is the timing at this point advanced medical directive oriented? Possibly not, but he already did this as we saw in a previous slide. So he already has that as a background. This would be further along in terms of his preferences and making sure that those ideas and, and values and, and choices still stand firm for him and his family. We move so, in, yeah, go ahead. 
Sorry. No, I'm <laughs> so, just moving along. <laughs> okay, good. We're in sync. Uh, the uh, the other uh, form that I would like to that we like to present to you is level of care. Um, if you go on the INES website, which is the Institut National d'Excellence en Santé et Services Sociaux, so it's a big acronym. So you just Google INES, and if you look at the uh, level of care, there's a um, this document that exists. It's a flyer that exists in French and English that explains what are the level of care. So there was an issue in the healthcare system. Every hospital had different type of level of care. Uh, some were using letters, some were using numbers, some was using one, two, three, four, some was using one, one A, one B. So there was like a mishmash of different level of care in different hospitals. So the government to kind of reset the uh, level of care across Quebec, uh, they did a study and they did uh, what would be best uh, to, be, to simplify different level of care. So now in Quebec, every healthcare establishment should be able, should use the INES uh, level of care. And level of care are objectives that you set to your, which are training doctor to see what type of care you would you like or what type of intensity of care would you like and also what type of care setting that will be, be able to meet your need. So let's look specifically at uh, the A, B, C, that uh, D, that uh, the NES kind of put together. So level care A, it's all treating, uh, all medical intervention that will uh, prolong your life. Uh, it could be very active, very aggressive. It could be a uh, different type of treatment. And you could imagine all the different treatments that, that that's possible that uh, could help to save your life and uh, bring you back to life and prolong your life and hopefully recover from uh, your disease and your your event. It could be an accident, it could be whatever an illness that uh, strikes you. You know, you agree to have all the care possible under the umbrella to save your life and keep you on going and hopefully uh, resume your level of activity that you had before. Level care B is more like, okay, let's prolong life, but let's set some little bit of limits in terms of what you want. And the doctor is able to kind of write in the, on that form the different limits you want to have. So you may decide, okay, let, give me everything possible, but if it's uh, to have a CPR or a cardiac uh, resuscitation process done, that I don't want, then that could be level B. And the doctor will write in the, in the common area, uh, do, not pro do not provide CPR, but do all the other care that's, uh, that's possible to keep prolonging the life with some, uh, with some limits. Level C and D is a bit more, it's a bit easier. You know, level C, it's uh, aiming at comfort care as opposed to, so more quality of life that could maybe lead to a, a situation where the patient may require palliative care at this moment. So comfort care is more in terms, let's start looking at the palliative care, introducing palliative care team to make sure that the patient's uh, signs and symptoms are better managed. And when I talk about palliative care, it means I talk about palliative care, that people also very, very often associate palliative care with cancer patients, but it could also be for any disease. It could be for Alzheimer's, it could be for Parkinson, it could be for any chronic disease, uh, advanced chronic disease, where a patient is not responding to all the, the traditional uh, treatment. And the only thing that could be aiming at is uh, comfort care. So that's the, uh, the objective that you would set with your specialist or your family doctor. And level care D, of course, well then, uh, there's a, to a point that uh, the patient is not responding to any medication or treatment, and really it's the comfort care and it's more quality over quantity of life. So really, if it's making sure that uh, you get a bit more uh, pain management, it, 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 we may provide you a bit more uh, sedation, but uh, the aim is really to, comfort, to provide comfort and pain relief. So uh, that's really more in terms of level D. Uh, level D. You can still get some, uh, of course, assigning symptoms uh, support with the level C, but the level D, it's really at the end tail of the disease where uh, the, uh, the effectiveness of some treatments are compromised and where the patient's uh, really looking at, okay, let's uh, do some distress protocol, which are treatments that are put for, for patients that are suffering advanced uh, lung problems and making sure that they're able to breathe and they're comfortable and their the anxieties are better control. So that could be uh, offered with the level D uh, at the end of life. So this is the, the different uh, order of intensive care. Of course, uh, 
level A, uh, it's very much uh, could be offered mostly in the hospital setting where they have access to all the, the different care and diagnostic tools. Uh, level B, C, D could be offered any, anywhere else. Uh, but if you need some uh, resuscitation, you know, uh, some, in some nursing homes or at home, they may start a maneuver and they may call 911 to transfer you to the hospital to get uh, uh, some other type of uh, treatment to, uh, to deal with your, with your heart failure. So that's also uh, to consider in the uh, level of care and also where the care can be provided. So we wanted to show you the form that the physicians have to fill. So the physician, it could be your GP or a specialist, they're gonna set uh, with you the different level of care. So at the beginning, they, uh, they have to assess your level of competency, if you're able to respond, or who's answering those questions for, for, for the person that's uh, not able to consent. So if you're the spouse, or if you're the uh, mandatory, or if you're a public creator, could also answer to those, uh, those questions in terms of, okay, what's the best level of intensity of uh, medical care provided? Then uh, they have to ask if you have uh, advanced directive, or if you have a your living will that you said before, so that'll be considered in the conversation. And then after the discussion with the physician and the patient, the patient and the, hopefully the patient, the patient and the physician will come to an agreement in terms of what's the best level of care. Patient could be like my father-in-law mentioned, he, could, he, want, he, may, he wants a level A, but maybe his cardiologist and said, well, you know, you're more, uh, your heart condition is more advanced and you really, you should go for C. But if the patient wants level A, then the doctor will write level A, and in the comment area, the doctor may write, well, according to my medical assessment, patient should uh, get level C, but wants level A. Please discuss this, this, this situation at his next hospitalization. So the doctor can personalize also the differences of opinion between the physician and between the fifth doctor, and sometimes the family members are part of that discussion in terms of uh, where they're at, in terms of the evolution of the disease, and their comprehension with the disease and the phase of the disease with the level of care that uh, would be required and the location of care, of course, that could be impacted with the decision that you make. So it's really a discussion uh, that could be held uh, at the end of the form. It's a physician that has to sign the level of care. Of course, uh, the treating teams, either at home or the hospital setting, could encourage you to have the discussion with the physician. Myself, as a social worker, I'm not a physician, but we, I often have the discussion with my, with my client at home to discuss, okay, what type of care you would like to have in the future, what type of, uh, what you're aiming with, are you try, trying to aim for a full recovery, do you think that your disease is uh, at the beginning stage or more towards the end of the, the disease? So I have that discussion and I help the, the patient to make sense of, okay, where they're at in terms of the disease and help the caregiver to also collaborate and be on board with the uh, level of care because uh, at home, who's gonna call 911 if the patient has a heart arrest is the caregiver. So it's very important that all parties on board are in sync. So the physician, the patient, but also the caregiver to make sure that uh, the right decision is made and that the care provided is appropriate according to the wish of the patient, but also according to his comprehension and what's medically wise to request. So. Uh, that's something to, to set, and it's it's kind of a uh, guiding principles that uh, of objective care that the physician wants to reach, and making sure okay, uh, what type of intensive care you want, and at the stage of the disease you're at. So it could change over time. You know, you could you could be A, you could be B, and some people are B, and then or you know, and they say okay, I'm getting chemo because I have cancer, and I may want to be level C, and then. You go through the course of chemo, radiation, and your cancer is well controlled. You, uh, you know, it's well maintained. And after a few years, you, you're in full remission, and the cancer is gone. And you may decide, okay, well, since my cancer is cured, uh, let's aim at a, a level of care A. So you can be put back at level A. So what I'm trying to explain is uh, the level of care can be changed according to the progress of the, your medical situation, and also not just just the, the dementia element, but also the, uh, the, other, the other physical uh, component of your file. So that's why it's signed with a physician to really assess uh, where the patient's at and to have that open discussion uh, where the, the patient's at. So 
yes, it's a medical decision uh, at the end of the, the, the form, but it's also uh, a comprehension where the patient's at and uh, what uh, care they should require. So uh, this is pretty much the end of our presentation today. So we have a few minutes if you have some specific questions in terms of level of care. This is an added element. But we felt, as Zell and I, that we should present it because um, very often caregivers will be confronted when a patient goes to uh, ER, okay, and uh, the, the tra treating team or the ER doctor, ER nurse may ask me, well, what was this level of care? What type of care you want in the future? And especially with somebody with dementia, uh, being in the ICU or ER, you know, they could be disoriented and not available to consent or not clear in terms of what they wanted. And the caregivers will be called and say, well, what, uh, what's the status? What, we, what type of discussion you had? So it's good to know uh, that uh, that uh, level of care exists and it uh, pertains to the intensive care that the, the patient will have. This, this information is, uh, you know, we, we understand and we can appreciate that it's a lot of information at one time and you may have a lot of questions around, you know, the, the technicalities of it, the criteria of it. And we'll talk a little bit more about palliative care next week. And, you know, we were trying to try to fit it in a little bit today, but we'll talk a little bit more, more specifically about a next presentation, as well as medical aid and dying. We'll go into more detail about that. But if you have any questions at all that sort of linger uh, from this presentation to the next, please keep those questions and we will certainly try to address them. Perhaps we'll save some time right at the beginning of the presentation so we can recapture some of that and then continue on uh, with the rest of the presentation um, that we have planned for you. Thank you for sticking, uh, sticking with us during this, you know, all of this information. And um, hopefully we've left you with some food for thought and uh, some good, uh, good information to follow up on for your particular situation or someone else that you know. I'll pass it over to Renny. Thank you. So thank you so much, Zelda and, and Patrick, for such an informative lecture. And I think what are some very challenging and very relevant topics. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's a great idea. We can take some time next session if, if people have questions in the intervening time. Um, I just, you know, want to make a few little housekeeping notes before we go. I just want to let everybody who's attending know to keep an eye on your email. You'll be getting the slides that our presenters have showed us today, and you'll also be getting a survey. Please do give us at AGI your honest, anonymous feedback. Um, the survey will also allow you to give us your input about what um, different topics for lectures that you'd like to see in the future. Um, and please join us again on April 22nd for the second part of this lecture. And, you know, if you have any further questions or there's anything on your mind related to what we've spoken about today or related to the experience of, of being a caregiver or, you know, of having or knowing someone with dementia, we do encourage you to connect with an AGI counselor either by phone or, or by email. That's always open to you. So thank you, everybody. And thank you to our two wonderful presenters. And we look forward to seeing you in a month's time. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Stay safe. Yes.